Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, AFRC. The Army officers included General I.K. Echampong, Major General E.K. Utuka, and Lieutenant General Amankwa Efrifa. Son of Lieutenant General Efrifa, Okateche Amankwa Efrifa, said although the experience was a difficult one, they had forgotten the past. Most of us, the forgiveness and the forgetfulness came in when their bodies were released because we got to know that now I know that this is where my daddy was buried. When it's his birthday or during this anniversary that we intend celebrating, you can just buy a wreath and you know where you are going to dump it. Unlike previously when we were kids and we were growing, there were a lot of speculation. We didn't even know where the bodies were and all that. After a presentation by the families to thank him for his role in ensuring the victims were given a befitting burial, the former head of state asked all politicians to live up to the honorable title. Well, Dean of Studies and Research at the Institute of Local Government Studies, Dr. Eric Odru Osai, says government stands the risk of jeopardizing the efforts of the Special Prosecutor's Office if it further delays in equipping the outfit. With barely a year to go for a major general election, Dr. Osai says political sentiments could be drawn into cases which legitimately seek to fight corruption. The political awareness in the country has over the last few years clouded the judgment of many, especially fanatics, of a governing party and the main opposition at every point in time. Even more supporters read political meanings into every action of the government, irrespective of which party is in power. With election 2020 approaching and the special prosecutor set to start prosecuting cases against politically exposed persons, Dr. Osai fears if care is not taken, this could make the election atmosphere quite tensed. But next year is an election year. If we have one year gone and uh, next year we are entering into an election year and we don't even know the cases that are likely to be prosecuted, there is this temptation that people will read meaning into it that you're going to stampede the court with all kinds of cases. And if majority of the cases works against the opposition, then they will read meaning into it. This we could have avoided. We should speed up the process of conducting investigations to gather evidence so that we'll be able to establish the prosecutable cases ahead of time. So we're going to go back to this particular story of the Office of Special Prosecutor, especially when some CSOs have been talking about it. We'll give you a brief of what we have been doing here as well at Media General, specifically on TV3. But so, so stay with us. But parts of Accra and its environs uh, became flooded Monday morning after a three-hour downpour. Some residents in flood-prone areas were compelled to call for help after their words were submerged in the flood waters. One of such areas is Kaswa Galilea, top town in the central region. A resident, Francis Deji, who sent us this video you're seeing on your screens, said some residents got stuck in their homes. He alleged the National Disaster Management Organization and more officials were called but to no avail. Meanwhile, a passerby at Jowulu, uh, Mojitaba Nuruddin Jara, also sent us some videos from Jowulu Junction opposite the Perez Church. According to him, at about 9.58 a.m., gutters were choked and the street filled with flood waters. That's what you're seeing right now on uh, your screens. Rather worrying there, but let's turn to MTN Vid reports this evening as our citizen journalist Enoch Echampong highlights on erosion along a road caused, causing a deep pit at Echama in the Ashanti region. This is an area in Kumasi, a place called Achuma Techiman. There's a very big pit. Look at how the situation is like. It's very bad. It has even come near the road. Cars can't even pass. So we are pleading the government to take a look at this and then come and help the people around this area because it's very bad and it can kill people around here.
Well, like Enoch's report, we look forward to receiving your video reports sent to us. You can do so via WhatsApp number. It's 055-1433044. Stay with us here on News 360. We've got a lot more coming up shortly. Welcome back to News 360, still to come tonight. Former CEO of the Minerals Commission, Dr. Tony Aubin, describes as welcoming reports by the World Bank that Ghana is the largest producer of gold in Africa. The attacks in the sub-region, Burkina Faso to be precise, where six people died, we'll be finding out from the Christian Council of Ghana what preparations are being put in place to safeguard the church and the Christian body as a whole. Martin Esiru Dato will be joining us later on with a brief on this. But on the international front tonight also, uh, Sudan's public prosecutor charges also President Mab Abashur with incitement and involvement in the killing of protesters. So that's what's coming up within the bulletin here on News 360. But Alfred, we brought a story earlier with regards to the Office of Absolutely. the Special Prosecutor and the work of the office. And as you may well be aware, the Office of the Special Prosecutor has received public criticism for its work, with some saying that the, the, works, the office works is happening way too slowly and others are, are of the view that, in fact, it's a new office and therefore time must be taken to hire lawyers and the like. But certainly the discussion goes on and what we have here is a list of cases, not the official list of cases released by the Office of the Special Prosecutor, but a list by individuals who have petitioned the Office of the Special Prosecutor to investigate these specific cases. So I'm going to run you by them pretty briefly. Former President John Dramani Mahama named as a respondent in a case alleged of, of alleged diversion of $13 million from the EO Group, which is a company with a 3.5 interest in Ghana's 2000 oil 2007 oil find. So that's one of the claims there which the former president has denied. Now, case of money laundering against former gender and social protection minister Nana Oyelitha and a former minister of information, Mahama Ayariga, accused of evading tax in the importation of some vehicles. These are a few cases that individuals have petitioned the office to look into and to investigate. Now, the governing, the governing party's chairman, Freddie Blay, for $11 million promised to get each of the 275 constituencies a minibus, leading to accusations of vote buying. And obviously, he was re-elected, but many spoke about the issues of vote buying and accusations of vote buying in that context. Former chief executive of Bost, Alfred Obing Barting, fingered in the decision to sell 1.8 barrels, million barrels of crude oil at a discounted price, which allegedly cost the nation some 30 million cities in revenue. And Information Minister and MP Kojo Apong Nkuma being investigated for the alleged abuse of office involving Ash Plant Pool Company. Now, he has submitted his caution statement responding to this issue, and we understand that there are, in fact, investigators who are looking into this issue of Kojo Opong Nkrumah. So these are just a few of the cases, as I said earlier, not the official list of cases, but individuals who have petitioned the office to look into these cases. Alfred. Great stuff. So, Natalie, thank you. It's just a wrap of this, but we're still keeping tabs on that particular office and in the coming days get some responses on this, these and many other issues on this table. Anti-graft agencies in partnership with CDD Ghana. Uh, government on resourcing this office of the special prosecutor to deliver on its mandate giving its assessment on the first year of the special prosecutor's office the CSOs against corruption say government must show commitment to fight corruption in February 2018 Martin Amidu was sworn in as Ghana's first special prosecutor with the mandate to investigate and prosecute corruption cases and recover monies stolen from the state. It's been over a year and already the special prosecutor has been called on to account for his stewardship. Martin Amidu has in the last few months complained about the non-availability of logistics and staff to help him prosecute cases brought before him. Speaking at a roundtable discussion to assess the first year of the Office of the Special Prosecutor, 
Dr. Kojo Asante, Director of Advocacy and Policy Engagement at CDD Ghana, said government needs to expedite action on the setting up of the office. The OSP, for example, has police powers. And in that regard, when he arrests or detains a suspect, he should have the requisite logistics, the appropriate holding vehicle, interrogation rooms and equipment to conduct investigations. That in spite of the huge amount that was allocated to the OSP for 2019, recruitment could not be expedited without an office to house the personnel. This means securing the office is critical to speeding up the operationalization of the office. It is our hope that both the OSP and government can find a quicker solution to the handing over of the current office that has been identified. He admits although some progress has been made, more could be done in effectively dealing with corruption at all levels. After over a year since the Office of the Special Prosecutor was established, we have seen progress, but it has not been fast enough to meet some of the expectations. There are a lot of cases that the OSP would have to deal with. This would take both investigation and prosecution if necessary. Though we have to be vigilant, we also have to remember the rights of the accused in how we report it. Four, a coordination, cooperation, and collaboration protocol is needed urgently to manage overlapping mandate. But generally, the OSP mandate is corruption and corruption-related offenses, and it is in order to give the OSP the first bite on these matters. The civil society groups against corruption are made up of Corruption Watch, a civil society coalition on the office of the special prosecutor, and Addis. Another group which is a member of the civil society organizations on anti-corruption is the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. The co-chair of this group, Adam Senna, who's joining me in studio. Senna, thank you for time this evening. So, I hear you know, Kujasan to talk about the uh, progress made Exactly what do you classify as progress made by this Office of Special Prosecutor? Well, I think that you need to look at the whole um, gamut of actions that have transpired from the point where we felt that we needed some office that was independent mm -hmm. from the Attorney General. Because in the past, our real concern was the fact that it was unlikely that an Attorney General appointed by a particular government sure. would take upon himself or herself to prosecute members of the same government. So, but, but others have argued that it's one thing appointing a special prosecutor, and another thing resourcing the person to work. Yeah. And so beyond just appointing the person. What progress were you measuring really? Because the person hasn't really done much to subject it to progress and analysis. Well, you know, for most of us who do development work, we talk about milestones, and those milestones may not necessarily be concrete infrastructure that mm -hmm. you see. Uh, they are just tangible things that have happened that one can say that this shows that there's been some progress. Mm -hmm. So when we didn't have a law, once the law came in, that was progress. We didn't have sub-legislation. Once that was promulgated, that tells you we've made progress. We didn't have an office location that was suitable for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you visited him, basically two offices and a boy's quarters partitioned for the investigators. Yeah, but a new office was located for him. I understand he hasn't moved in yet. No, that's not the case. We originally had one location, mm -hmm. but the building was so dilapidated that it was better probably building from scratch. True. So they've had to find a new uh, building, which is now uh, suitable for the purposes that they're thinking but about. Has he moved in to that new no, building? No, he's not going to move in because it still has to be resourced. Precisely. Now, and I, I think I, that's I, the point that Dr. Sa uh, uh, Kujo Asante is making strongly, that, you know what, Let's fast track all of these things so that we can get to the point where it is not about infrastructure, it's not about logistics, but they can deliver on the core mandate. Some have argued that before the formation of this office, some of these things should have been thought about already. I agree with you. So, <laughs> why are we where we are now? Yeah, well, I mean, part of his assessment today points out that it appears that uh, he said the state, but I think all of us, underestimated the scope of work involved in putting in place an institution of that nature. Mm. We do know that in fighting corruption, you need both strong leadership and strong institutions. And we are now building that institution. So a roadmap that detailed you know, the specifics to getting that should have been put out. One that takes on board all these things of a building, of the chairs, the number of people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a holding room for people who are arrested, the kind of vans they need to pick people up, the interrogation rooms. All of those should have been mapped out. And then you probably have a good 
expectation in terms of what is the reality in the number of days or months that it will take to have this properly in place? A quick one. I know that in the 2019 budget, 180 million was allocated to this office. Did you find out how much of that money has been released to him? No, we don't know for a fact how much has been released so far. But it will also depend on how much has been requested. Yes, I know. I thank you. Alfred, as usual. <laughs> Grateful for your time as always this evening. Adam Sinanu is a co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. He's a member of the anti-corruption civil society organizations who are knocking at the doors of the president to do something more than just what has been done so far to resource the office of the special prosecutor. And following the attacks on churches, uh, we ask what measures are churches in Ghana putting in place to secure lives and property in the wake of these attacks in Burkina Faso. Martin Asiodo Date has been speaking with the General Secretary of the Christian Council of Ghana, Reverend Dr. Cyril Fayose. The Christian Council of Ghana is extremely concerned about what is happening around the world, not only in our sub-region. Our sense of security was heightened when we heard what happened in Christchurch, New Zealand, because we, we felt like there may be uh, reprisal attacks. And not long ago, we also heard on Easter Sunday the attacks in Sri Lanka. And then we also heard about what is happening in Burkina Faso. And then the alert also came in from Axis that uh, Salafi jihadists are moving down towards uh, Ghana. So all these are signs, they are writings on the wall, they are warning signs to us that we must wake up, we must stop sleeping or start, stop slumbering and do something, start preparing for such persons in uh, coming down to our country, yes. What preparations have you put in place as the Christian Council and as a, the, the Christian body as a whole? In fact, one of the preparations we have put in place is a training workshop for Christian leaders of our member churches and also for their security personnel in their churches to train them to create one, to create awareness about the situation, what is happening, and that they should also educate their members to be aware of their surroundings because security is a collective thing. We are also training them in case it actually happens. People come into our situation and there is a strike. What do we actually do? How do you run? How do you hide? How do you fight? This training is going on. We are going to roll out more of this training, and they should come for the training because it's extremely critical. Stay with us here on News 360. We've got business news coming up shortly. Hello, other good evening, and welcome to the business news segment on News 360. My name is Park Yassari. Thanks very much for making time with us. We begin with um, activities within the uh, gold industry, and former Chief Executive Officer of the Minerals Commission, Dr. Tony Aubin, has described as welcoming a report by the World Bank that Ghana is the largest producer of gold in Africa. He, however, wants the Minerals Commission to introduce measures to maintain their achievements. According to the report, Ghana exported 158 tons of gold in 2018, about 15% increase over the previous year. Ghana has thus dethroned South Africa, which produced 139.3 tons and returned to the high volumes of the 1980s. In an exclusive interview with TV3 Business, former CEO of the Minerals Commission, Dr. Tony Obing, said the news is not in doubt. It's a happy news for me, happy news for the country, if that is so. But uh, how much does it add to, to you know, our lives? That's more important because uh, if after production, it, not enough is added to our lives, then it becomes a, a hollow production. He, however, wants some clarity from the Minerals Commission on how Ghana achieved this feat. If you look at the trend in the last um, few years, you would want to believe that. And uh, the only shock, which is positive though, is that last year, if you look at 2017, um, Ghana produced 101 tons of gold. At that time, I think, I think South Africa produced 140 tons. So why the significant decline and then the, the significant increase by us, by Ghana, is, is really interesting. And I think maybe, maybe, just maybe, 
maybe the the uh, minerals concern would want to come out to confirm he believes flexibility in the sector can make ghana's mining industry competitive i think that the law itself the constitution itself allows for the mining i mean the, the, the uh, parliament to grant that right to an institution or to some individuals to look at the ratification of some you know minor minerals minerals that are not major you know rather than having to go to parliament otherwise honestly if parliament were, were to ratify all the mineral uh, applications they wouldn't have anything to do apart from doing that the, the world bank attributed the achievement to the operations of large-scale mining firms in the country including newmont's mining corporation goldfields anglo gold ashanti and asanko gold Go now. So some selected mothers in three regions have been given a special treat by Awake Purified Drinking Water as part of activities market Mother's Day. The Casa Perco Company subsidiary randomly took over 40 parents out on shopping in Accra, Kumasi, and Takradi. Awake Purified Drinking Water, a subsidiary of Casa Perco Company Limited, set out to surprise mothers in three major cities, starting from Takrade, then to Kumasi, and later on in Accra. In Takrade, shopping mothers were spotted and their groceries paid for. <laughs> In Kumase, 15 widows were bus to the Asafu market and giving money to shop at will. Hey, in Accra, 15 widows were bused to the Accra Mall and were giving money to shop at game. It was all joy for these wonderful mothers. Later on, the AWAKE team went to the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. So on behalf of AWAKE Purified Drinking Water, we are here on the occasion of Mother's Day to present this widow's might to the MBE unit. So for this year, Mother's Day, we've realized that it's important to cherish and appreciate all mothers, what we do. It's not easy being a mother. Today, we say, Ma, mi mo. Yeah, so for awake purified drinking water, I mean, when you think of awake, uh, heart and cardiovascular activities come to mind. But today on Mother's Day, we decided to go out in a different way to celebrate, to cherish, and to remember our mothers. And uh, through the vision of uh, Dr. Pabune J and an approval of the MDB Mr. J, we decided to go all out in three different cities. So we'd like to thank all consumers and Ghanaians in general for supporting AWIC and then the One for Life initiative. And so to all mothers in Ghana from AWIC Purified Drinking Water, we'd like to say a very big thank you and then Mamimo to all of you for supporting us. Mami Mo, uh, quite an exciting treat there by Awake Purified Water to all mothers across the country. Thanks very much for watching. That's all for the business news segment here on News 360. My name is Marcus Yassari. Thanks very much for watching. For more business news stories, you can log on to our website, 3news.com. All right, so it's now time for some entertainment and lifestyle news with me. Nana Quadrado. Now, VGMA is coming up this weekend, and we want to find out who wins the overall artist of the year this year's at uh, this year's VGMA is now Owusu Arai takes us down memory lane as he brings winners of the prestigious awards right from its inception in 1999. The prestigious Ghana Music Awards has for 18 years been celebrating outstanding Ghanaian musicians. The award has always left in its trail varied sentiments. While losers are left disappointed, it is all bliss for the big winners on any VGMA night. 2000, Daddy Lumba. 
born Charles Kojofosu, aka Daddy Lumba, the singer won Artiste of the Year at the Maiden Ghana Music Awards, held in the year 2000. Released in 1998, DL's mega hit, Abinwaha, did the magic for the hitmaker. Patronage of the song soared thanks to speculations that Abinwaha had then been banned by the National Commission on Culture for its explicit content. Curious to know the content? Music lovers grabbed copies of the cassette, making it an instant hit. 2001, Kojo Entry. Born Julius Kojo Entry, Afro pop high life and reggae musician, Kojo Entry, also known as Music Maestro, succeeded Lumba, winning the 2001 awards. Celebrated for his vocal prowess, Kojo Entry still remains relevant after over three decades of gracing the music scenes. Other top VGMA winners include 2002. Rapper Lord Kenya won the topmost honors in the year. Lord Kenya, now an evangelist, won the competition ahead of his bitterest rival, Obrafo. 2003, Conti Hene. 2004, VIP. Two thousand and five, Bice Osei Kufo, aka Obor. Two thousand and six, Euphoria Two thousand and seven, Samini. Two thousand and eight. Kwokese. Uh -huh. 2009. Ochiame Kwame. 2010. Sarkodie. Uh -huh. 2011. After seven years, VIP came back much stronger to win the Artiste of the Year for the second time in 2011. So we're looking forward to find out who wins that prestigious Artist of the Year award uh, this Saturday at the Accra International Conference Center. So tomorrow we'll be bringing you the rest of the winners who've been uh, who've won the award in the past years. Now, moving on to the second and final story for tonight. Days after news of the murder of Betty Jennifer, wife of Ghanaian actor Chris Atto broke, uh, it has emerged that Betty was married to another man in Baltimore, USA. According to NBCWashington.com, the police report stated the other man, Kendrick Jennifer, is a convicted Baltimore drug lord who is currently serving a 20-year jail prison sentence for importing large amounts of cocaine into Baltimore from Texas. According to the website, court records show that April 9. So that's how we wrap up tonight's edition of entertainment news on News 360. My name is Nana Kwebjwado. Don't forget, I always tell you, I'm black and proud. <laughs> on behalf of the team, we say thank you. My name is Alfred Akansi. I'm black and proud. And I'm Natalie Force. Thanks so much for watching. I'm black and proud.